I survived 100 days as an outlaw in Bannerlord, and this is what happened. In the first 33 days, Astrid fought tooth and nail to make her way in a man's world when she had absolutely nothing. No money, no food, no weapons, and not even enough strength to start a fight, let alone win it. But thanks to her ruthlessness, she managed to prove herself to others and with their help, defeated several gangs of bandits and took whatever they had. Provisions, gold and equipment, even a horse which is a valuable asset for multiple reasons. From there, she's built a devout cult dedicated only to her, and they were ready to take on the world, but due to a sudden lapse in judgment, she led them all into a dead end as they were being chased by the local authorities. Caught by the personal retinue of an Aserai lord, there was seemingly no escape for our little lady and her band of misfits. The only way out is forward. Dune Raiders, to glory! Astrid shouted before John, her most loyal companion, ordered the lads to stop and said to her, My lady, let me lead the troops. You can still escape. The men must have been truly inspired to lay down their lives for a woman they've only met a few weeks ago, but when you're faced with certain death, the best you can hope for is that your story will live on. With a religious fervor, Astrid's cult charged towards their doom in order to distract the Aserai patrol and allow her to walk away unscathed. Looks like the myth of honor among thieves is true after all. But allowing her soldiers to pay for her tactical errors had unintended consequences. Hakana noticed she wasn't among the dead and began spreading rumors about her cowardice. That's not ideal, but as long as she's alive, she can always rebuild her reputation and enact revenge upon the Lordling for the murder of John and her apostles. All was not lost, however. On the horses' saddlebags, we still had a few snacks and we were dragging along a couple of Harami prisoners, who've witnessed Astrid's fierceness firsthand and understood why she had to flee that battle. As outlaws, they're grateful she did it, because otherwise, the Aserai would have put their heads on spikes as well. But I hear you thinking to yourself, who's we? Astrid's on her own. Well, I am, of course, her battle instinct. That's why it sounds like a male voice. Women weren't bred for battle, so when they have to adapt, they adopt masculine features. Moving on isn't something we can do very quickly. We're still disorganized after that defeat and since we were burdened by sorrow, a band of five looters caught up and demanded we Oi, pay for we safe here? passage. There's a tax for passage in these parts, traveler. Gold is rare these days, so I paid in iron instead. In return, the looters were kind enough to offer me a barrel of date fruits, but I was already lugging around more than I could carry and couldn't afford additional weight. I then made my way into the deep desert, to the hideout which was a safe haven during my first few days here. I was planning to clear the place out, but I couldn't do it alone, so I waited for about three days until both sinners decided to join me. With their help, taking over this gang is a lot more feasible. At first glance, you'd believe that the bandits' numeric superiority renders them automatically victorious. However, despite being outnumbered, the three of us stuck together, whereas the Bedouins are spread thin all throughout their base of operations. When I spotted my first enemy, I attempted to sneak up to him and land a cheap shot, but he passed the perception check and denied me that little pleasure. Still, I did manage to bludgeon him once and then tricked him into chasing me to my two friends who finished the job. And that's what I tried to do every time I spotted hostile life signs. Land a hit if I can, get the kill if I'm lucky and if I can't, simply draw them into the trap my Haramis prepared. And since my lads are equipped with ranged weapons, I give them the freedom to fire at will and if they missed, I'd simply pick up the projectiles myself. Could prove useful. With this stratagem in place, I advanced throughout the hideout, attempting to rack up as many kills as possible, but I got careless at some point and earned a bit of head trauma, which decreased my efficiency for the rest of the fight. Humbled by that experience, I decided to stop taking unnecessary risks and just stick to the plan which worked out much better for us. And whenever we were faced with multiple foes, I would use the Jereeds to reduce their numbers and stack the odds in our favor, but I took care to keep some projectiles for the final confrontation. 
After the bulk of the bandits were killed or wounded, their box came out of hiding and challenged me to a duel. I wasn't entirely sure I was a match for him because both my gear and my skills leave a lot to be desired, but I do have two things he does not. Javelins and cunning. As soon as the duel began, I started running away and then threw a spear at him which he blocked with his shield, as expected. Same with the second throw, but the third one broke his bulwark and I still had four missiles to spare. He was still standing after the first javelin hit him in the chest and he locked out when I missed my next shot. I nearly got sliced there, but when I landed my next hit, the ringleader was neutralized. Still alive though, thanks to the serious armor he was wearing. Victorious at last, I went to his lads, who watched our fight with great interest and told them, Oi! You boys follow me, or I'll give you a thump! They were reluctant to join me, so they came as prisoners at first, but they'll soon realize that they don't need a leader who can win a fair fight through sheer strength, but one who is willing to fight dirty because that's who will ensure them many victories. The manpower is just part of the reward, however. The resources are equally important and this hideout had a few nice things lying around. 400 gold, an unsightly helmet to protect the noggin, a bunch of food and a lot of equipment that would fetch a small fortune. After I sold the spoils of war to the village of Walters, I had a devious idea. What if I ambush these peasants as they attempt to sell their goods to the market? So I waited a little and when they left, me and my two Haramis went after them. When we caught up, we inquired about their transport and as expected, in addition to their produce they were also carrying all the loot I gave them and they kindly offered to sell it to me at a discount. So now they're willing to trade when they know their lives are at stake. Thanks, but I'll just take it for free. Three riders versus 16 peasants. I'd say our odds of success are pretty good, so I told my lads to hold fire and close in and when they did, they launched their jerids upon our victims. All of them missed, of course, at which point I just ordered them to attack at will, knowing their tendency to use cycle charges whereas they run at the enemy, strike, run away and then do it again. In the meantime, Astrid just circled around the villagers, taking jabs at them, but this wasn't as easy as it sounds, because the peasants peppered her with pebbles and well, that sounds harmless, there's a high chance for the lady to get knocked unconscious and our attack to be repelled. But Astrid's shield was painted with the Hagal rune and proved itself adequate defense against the hail of stones that poured down on her. And whenever there was a break in the hailstorm, she seized every opportunity to strike down the villagers from her high horse. The attack was brutal and in just a couple of minutes, all the peasants laid dead, except for the last one who refused to relent. I gave him the honor of a duel and he stood his ground valiantly until one of my haramis got bored and stabbed him in the back. I guess there's no turning back now. Up to this point, Astrid was doing whatever she needed to do in order to survive, and the only people she's hurt were other bandits. Now, she's fully embraced the role forced upon her by this world. A criminal. Let's hope she's better at it than she was at being a merchant's apprentice. And it would seem that crime does pay. Because of this attack, we've stolen a bit of food, a portion of the equipment I sold to the village and most importantly, a workhorse that allows us to carry a lot more plunder. We were still over encumbered, but a nearby settlement allowed us to unburden ourselves and get richer in the process. Slowly but surely, Astrid's financial situation is improving as she's already got 5550 gold in her coin purse. If she found more people, she could afford to scale her operations, so now all we needed to do was wait for the outlaws we captured to swear fealty to their new queen. But we've had enough of the desert, so it was time we moved on to greener pastures. On the dawn of day 40, we've already reached the border of the southern empire and it was time to meet the local wildlife forest bandits. 
different animals from those found in the desert. Just as poorly armored, but a lot deadlier due to their proficiency with the bow and arrow. My cavalry had to adapt to the new situation, put their javelins away, raise their shields high and charge forth with all their might. One arrow is all it takes to bring Astrid's reign of terror to an end, so as you can imagine, she put a lot more emphasis on defense than offense. Still, within a minute, the foresters were defeated, all of them slain by our hero. I would say that my men were useless, but at the very least, they gave our foes someone else to shoot at while she stabbed them with the spear. After looting some arrows, I got an idea. Why don't we try finding a bow? That way, I can defeat entire groups of villagers all by myself, without putting the lives of my men at stake. With this fresh goal in mind, we spent the next few days hunting down all the forest bandits we could find, but after annihilating three entire groups, all I found was a scimitar. Still, that's a decent weapon. I mean, I love the mace, but its limited reach makes it difficult to hit anything from horseback. A sword is much better in that regard. After a few more attempts, I eventually gave up trying to find a bow in here and set course towards the steppe, because that place is renowned for its horse archers. Maybe they'll have some fun toys they're willing to share. In the meantime, a couple of desert riders joined the crew, and now there were five of us. On the evening of day 45, we eventually found another gang of five riders, step bandits. We should be able to deal with them if we catch up. The bastards are fast. The chase took us several days, but thanks to my unnatural ability to navigate dark places, I managed to catch them as they entered a forest, and then they died. Well, not all of them, thankfully. One of the marauders got captured, but I lost two of my nomads, so overall this wasn't the best trade deal. But I have to share details about this battle after all, it's the first time we encounter the stepbrothers. At first contact, I poked a marauder with my spear, then prodded him with my sword and then switched to my mace in an attempt to capture him. After four hopeless swings, one of my men stabbed him without mercy. A shame, he would have made a fine addition to our gang. I then attempted to wound another one with the spear, but I missed his shoulder and ventilated his skull instead. Seeing how lethal I can be without meaning to, I resorted to using only the mallet and eventually managed to injure one of the skirmishers, but the last one got sliced up before I could get to him. After mourning the fallen and claiming the loot, I explored the area, looking for more gangs we could subdue because I could use horse archers in my crew. A few days later, me and my three Haramis were caught by seven step bandits, which we repelled with relative ease. We actually managed to injure four of them and they'll join up with us, sooner or later. It took some effort, but I believe it's worth it. I even found a fine steel spear in the loot, which will undoubtedly serve me much better than the one I had equipped. For the following four days, we've done nothing but roam around, looking for brigands or peasants to attack. Our search was fruitless, but at least some of the prisoners decided to join up, including the desert boss that survived two javelins to the chest. Captivity was boring and they saw us having too much fun. When there were six of us, we've challenged a herd of forest beasts to a fight and finally found my first bow. Unfortunately, due to a skill issue, I can't wield it and even if I could, long bows can't be used on horseback without years of training, so the search continues. Can you guess what I got after my next fight? You guessed correctly, another longbow. At the very least, I'm grateful we're no longer scraping by, praying for our next meal. And we can instead waste time on such trivialities. We're in a pretty privileged position right now. We got a small gang that can fight other outlaws and even pillage peasants. And we are too fast to be caught by the nobility, as long as I'm careful and don't lead my men into another Hakan incident. But comfort breeds weakness and up until day 58, we've lived a comfortable life with barely any conflict even though at this point, there were 10 of us. The men were looking forward to our next operation. When we saw a poorly defended village on the border of the Empire, we decided to make it our next target. So we rode in, fought the local militia, looted the fallen, Astrid upgraded her shield and then she spotted some clay pots filled with purple and white paint. After all, why not? 
why shouldn't she apply a bit of makeup, like all the other pretty girls at court? We then attempted to raid this village, but before we even plundered anything, the local law enforcement arrived and chased us off. Damn their rapid response time. In retrospect, I should have just forced the locals to bring us some supplies, but uh, oh well. At least I have the gift of hindsight. With nothing better to do, we resumed our bandit hunting routine and found an upgrade for Astrid's armor, but before long, we were back to doing nothing, just running around the continent looking for opportunities and twiddling our thumbs in anticipation. But on the morning of day 64, we suddenly came to the realization that we had some problems with our food situation and shortly after, found the solution. A group of 30 villagers hailing from a nearby wheat farm who were carrying a ton of grain which would probably keep us fed for months. Poor bastards never stood a chance. My horsemen simply rode up to them and unleashed a hail of projectiles. Most javelins missed their intended targets, but the horsebowmen provided a constant stream of arrows that doomed these unarmored and unshielded peasants to certain death. To make matters worse for them, I ordered the cavalry to go to the right flank, and once they occupied that position, they were told to travel to the left, through the peasants, who were menacingly marching towards my rangers who could simply move farther away at the first sign of trouble. I then gave my calf the order to move back to the right, sweeping through the villagers once again. Did I do it because it's efficient? Yes, but I mostly did it for my own amusement. But I quickly got bored of that, so I ordered everyone to charge and the rest of the fight was over in a minute. There were no survivors. If these civilians just gave us their goods, they'd still be alive and we wouldn't have damaged half the stuff during the fighting. Oh well, that's still 10 times more food than I was carrying, so all in all, it was good. In fact, my men were so excited for the goods that they've completely forgotten to strip the dead of their rags and pitchforks, as they usually do. But I didn't need this much grain, so I made my way to a village and sold most of it, along some loot I've stolen from other raids. The locals couldn't afford to purchase all of it, but in an overwhelming display of generosity, I just accepted whatever they could pay. And now that we've improved our food situation, it was time to move on to my next goal, increasing the size of the crew. This area is swarming with hill tribes. Why don't we try recruiting some of them? If they want to live, it's logical that they'll just surrender and join the bigger gang. Well, this trio decided to defy logic and denied my generous offer. And they've also killed one of my marauders, the Insolence. This duo didn't join us either, despite being at a severe disadvantage. Neither did these four, at least not immediately, nor these five, although we did rescue an Imperial recruit from them, and the male mittens I looted made their rejection sting a lot less. Looks like the hill tribes are a lot less logical than I was expecting. To make matters worse, our recruitment attempts were interrupted when an imperial lady took a special interest in me and my lads and drove us off, but soon enough, I was back to being rejected by the local outlaws. Some of those that survived our attacks did eventually join up, but only after a considerable effort. Before long, we were back in the steppe planning to raid some hideouts because the criminals don't want to join us without a fight. Astrid isn't persuasive enough for that. Yet. And even though we were being pursued by Mesui, the matriarch of a prominent Kuzeid clan, we stopped at the first hideout we found and ambushed the inhabitants in the middle of the night. My men swept across the bandit camp, killing everyone in their path, while I attempted to save some lives with my mace, at least until a few arrows forced me to prioritize my own survival instead. After most of the gang was slaughtered, I was confronted by their chieftain who, unlike the first one I fought, didn't have a shield to protect him from my javelin. One hit, one kill. That's all it takes to get a bunch of raiders to fall in line. They were even kind enough to donate their belongings to our cause. Equipment, horses and even a bit of food to ensure that we have all our nutritional needs met. Everything that a growing gang needs. 
and since we are extremely efficient, this didn't even slow us down and we could simply walk away from Mesui's horde. A couple of days later we were back to raiding peasants and this time I allowed the hill tribes to prove their worth. If they impress me, they'll be permitted to ride the horses we've claimed in our last incursion. They handled themselves pretty well and when the dust settled, we claimed half of the iron ore carried by the villagers but when it was over, I spotted something in the distance. A couple of them managed to make their escape. Nah, uh uh can't let that happen. So I gave chase, put them to the sword and got half of what I earned the first time. Had to squeeze them till the very last drop. A good thing too, that iron fetched 700 gold when sold in the nearby village of Hoka. And when I spotted the peasants from Hoka returning home after a successful trade run, I approached them and they gave me another 700 gold out of the kindness of their own heart. They knew that my band of pilgrims were struggling to make ends meet, and their act of generosity brought our wealth over the threshold of 10,000 gold. A small sum in the grand scheme of things, but considering Astrid's humble beginnings, this is quite an accomplishment. Thank you, villagers of Hoka. May you live long, prosperous lives so that you may continue to enrich those around you. I then discovered another step bandit hideout which we assaulted using the same tactics as before, although this time I was a lot more efficient at saving lives, even that of the local leader who took two javelins to the chest like a champ. And because our prisoner capacity was getting full, I also enlisted the help of eight kuzets we've rescued from slavery. Well, as soon as my actual soldiers healed up, the rookies were let go because they were dragging us down. Maybe I shouldn't have fired them, but at the time, I really needed all the speed I could muster and dismounted peasants just slow our pace. I even had a brief run-in with the Sultan himself. Sorry, I couldn't ask him how he's doing. We ran as soon as we spotted his banner, but I hope he's having a great day. But the crew still needed to be expanded and as I was exploring the steppe, looking for more prospects, I discovered another hideout. And another one. And another one. That's all well and good, but our prisoner capacity is at its limit, so we'll have to wait for some of them to join up before we launch another ambush. While waiting, I've done my usual routine. Roam around, scout for targets, annihilate the occasional gang of looters, fence my spoils to a couple of villages, slaughter a bunch of sheep farmers, extort some local farmhands and even squeeze the villagers from Shapeshte. They were quite salty about it. And in case you need a refresher, squeezing is a raiding tactic that requires you to immediately stop the attack the moment you break the enemy's morale, let the survivors walk away, loot the battlefield, then intercept those who've escaped and take whatever they managed to steal from you. Of course, squeezing may actually have a happy ending for both parties involved, if the runners agree to return all of your stolen property without another fight. That would be qualified as a successful robbery, but it's rare for it to occur, because it is based on the false premise that dirt scratchers don't actually yearn for the day they ascend to high heavens, leaving this horrible plane of existence forever. Me? I like it here, I'm having too much fun. But to pull my head out of the clouds, Astrid's gang squeezed those peasants precisely one year after she was stranded in the desert all alone, so that's quite the anniversary. As me and the lads were celebrating, one of the raiders we've kidnapped from the steppe decided to join the party and brought the gang to a nice round 20 members. But we still had a lot left to achieve, so I liquidated some of my assets and prepared to leave this portion of the world behind. Next destination? I don't know yet. As far away from here as possible, the Kuzets are a bunch of weirdos. They put two armies together to besiege a nearby castle, and instead of focusing on their war effort, they wasted their time following Astrid around, like they're her biggest fans. Maybe one day, she'll have enough groupies with her to sign the Kuzets and Autograph in blood. As soon as I was rid of them, I picked my next destination, Batania, my former home. Along the way, we outran Imperial patrols, considered battling a mercenary, attempted to recruit more bandits and even managed to assault some peasants, which greatly improved our food stocks. After selling a few things into the village of Ismilkorg, we got ready to pillage, but when the militia gathered up and calmly told us, no. 
We wisely agreed and chose another target, the Batanian village of Seordas, a stone's throw away. I commend the defenders for their bravery. Unfortunately for them, they didn't even give us a scratch. A scratch that, I did get injured a little, but there were no casualties among us. As we were plundering the village, my scout informed me that an imperial banner is approaching, so we made ourselves scarce until the threat was gone, and then went back to work. Arion wasn't there for Astrid, but since she was in his way, he was tempted to make her acquaintance. It's not every day you meet such a beautiful girl. The pillaging continued for the entire evening, but as dawn broke, my scout told me that Arion's party is engaged in battle with a mercenary who is surprisingly not hostile towards my organization. Sensing an opportunity to get a little payback against the nobility who runs this world and think themselves untouchable surrounded by their elite troops, I rode to the help of that mercenary as fast as I could and ordered my men to attack. But carefully, I want them to kill for me, not die for me. As for myself, I managed to strike down a couple of enemy horsemen, one with my scimitar, the other with the mallet. When it was all over, I realized that one of my haramis perished, even though I specifically asked him not to do it. Guess he had too many sins to atone for, and chose martyrdom instead of loyal service. The spoils of war weren't that special, but at least I managed to make a lord feel vulnerable. If I were the one to capture him instead of the merc, he would have lost his head, but this is acceptable too. I then returned to Serodas to continue raiding it, but I was chased off by another imperial noble, who eventually caught the mercenary I helped a few days prior and managed to dismantle his warband. When I was in the clear, I attempted to plunder this village a few more times, but every single time, a larger party showed up and forced me to flee, so in the end, I just gave up. So we made our way to another village to sell our ill-gotten grains and then realized it's been 94 days since our journey began and we needed to accomplish something truly remarkable to inspire the troops before we close this chapter of Astrid's life. And so, the gang made its way into Batania, looking for a worthy challenge and not long after, we spotted a caravan defended by 39 mercenaries. We chased it for a bit, but we soon realized that 39 are too many for my 21 to handle, so we abandoned the chase. Moments later, we spotted a Batanian convoy with only 30 defenders, which awakened a painful memory in Astrid's mind, as she was reminded by her father's caravan. Still, this is her life now, and if she wants it to be good, then she's gotta make other people's lives difficult, even a non-existent in some cases. But nobody's shown her any mercy, so why should she? When we caught the traitors, the painful memories stopped because these weren't Batanians like her father. They were Imperials from the city of Epicrotea, but they bear the Batanian flag ever since their town was conquered by Caladog. Even so, Astrid was having second thoughts, so she's decided to sell most of the gang's possession to the traveling merchants, earning us 2400 dinars in the process, and she was going to stop at this. But when the transaction was concluded, she glanced over at her men and noticed their itching for a fight. So this is out of her control now. Still, she did make one last-ditch effort to avoid unnecessary bloodshed, when she told the caravan master that famous saying, Your money or your life. It is often said that the love for money is the root of all evil, and since the merchants love their money more than their lives, we are now forced to commit evil acts upon them. Dune Raiders, you know what to do. Wait, actually you don't, because this is our first caravan raid. Fear not, I will lead us to fortune. When the battle began, the defenders sent rangers to harass us, so me and my riders charged forth and I claimed my first kill. Then they attempted to flank us, so they rode uphill and then downhill into a pit. 
which I could use to minimize my casualties. If we corral the enemy horsemen in here, we could take them out before their archers can provide fire support. Initially, our foes were stuck in here with just me and my cavalry, and we did pretty good, until Astrid got reminded of her mortality as a crossbow bolt pierced her flesh. The shooter paid for that in blood. But Astrid noticed she was getting surrounded and fought hard to escape the mosh pit that was forming all around her. When she could breathe free once more, she realized that our horse archers weren't contributing to the violence, so I ordered them to enter the pit and rain arrows upon the enemy, while our assault units tore them to shreds. In the meantime, I killed one more enemy combatant and gave another one a non-lethal brain injury, but also got wounded in the process. I then attempted to make quick work of another caravan guard and proceeded to duel him for what felt like an eternity. Both of us relentlessly took jabs at each other, both of us blocked every strike, almost every strike. I did score some hits, but even then, it wasn't enough to pierce his armor and I had to wait for one of my men to come by and stab him in the back. By this point, most of the enemy's cavalry has been ravaged and the only ones left were the armed traders. Good offense, poor defense. We capitalized on our only advantage and simply charged at them to rob them of the chance to shoot us with their longbows. Well, I left that to my men because I was stuck dueling another guardsman who stubbornly blocked all of my attacks. Luckily for me, he was too distracted and didn't pay attention to one of my lads coming from behind. Not much happened after that. The remaining enemies were scattered, dazed and confused. Not much of a threat. All we needed to do was clean up the battlefield so that we can get looting, but I couldn't let my men do all the work. So I put my arsenal to good use and freely dispensed some head trauma. I then dueled another enemy rider who, unlike his predecessors, refused to use protection and after just a couple of thrusts, he already passed out from exhaustion. What a two-pump jump. Soon after, the last surviving armed trader fell to my blade and uh, he wasn't surviving anymore. I also rushed forth to strike down the last man standing, but my lads got him before I could, and so we were victorious. That was a fierce fight, and I was expecting to suffer great losses, but when the dust settled, I was relieved to learn that out of the six cultists who have fallen, only one of them lost his life. May this marauder rest in peace, I never asked him for his name. But his sacrifice wasn't in vain. This raid earned us more wealth than we've seen in the last month. Expensive gear, horses, livestock, trade goods and enough food to last us a year. And on top of that, this success inspired one of our captive marauders to join up and take the place of the man we've lost in the attack. But we were three days short of 100, which means we still have some stuff to do. My primary goal was to keep expanding the gang, so I was headed into the mountains of Vlandia, looking for hill tribes to recruit, but along the way, I rounded up two parties of villagers. They were practically begging to be robbed. The first group gave us 90 sacks of grain and some animals, while the second only gave us 4 workhorses and a few coins. I then caught a Vlandian trade convoy and convinced them to give me all their gold by uh, selling my plunder, not stealing from them. I'll try to play it fair from now on. If a caravan is willing to buy my stolen goods, I'll let them pass, and if I want to attack them, I won't sell them my loot. If I do both things too often, I might run out of people who are willing to purchase my stuff, and I don't want to tarnish my reputation any further. I may be a criminal, but professionals have standards. After that, Astrid continued her journey into the mountains of Vlandia, and along the way, she has spotted some sea raiders just standing there menacingly. We might be able to beat them, but they clearly know something we don't, so I just kept my distance. We also discovered a couple of hideouts which will most likely raid at some point in the future, but for the time being I just attacked a few small gangs that crossed my path, adopting the survivors of those massacres into my family. But then we ran into a warband just like ours with a little over 20 members and it was time to see which one was stronger. The surviving losers will eventually join the winners. To ensure our victory with as few casualties as possible, I ordered the cavalry to form a shield wall in front of the skirmishers while the enemy gets peppered with projectiles. 
Most of these poor bastards don't even have clothes, let alone shields, so their fates are sealed. I didn't want to waste time with them, so after injuring one, I focused on the highwaymen. The first one was dispatched with a single, masterful thrust of my spear, but the other dueled me for what felt like an eternity. The first stab dealt heavy damage and knocked him off his horse, but after that, he fought like a cornered animal, which, for all intents and purposes, he is, because my lads have already killed or injured most of his boys. For a long time, we took jabs at each other, but mostly missed, although I did get lucky at some point and stabbed him in the gut, but the beast was still standing. As my men ran out of targets, they began shooting at him, and after getting an arrow in the back, I was expecting him to keel over. Nope. This was the first time in my life I've witnessed true berserker rage. The highwayman was literally too angry to die, and this earned my respect. So I ordered my men to stand down and evacuate the battlefield, then descended from the saddle, planning to give this warrior a proper duel. Sensing the opportunity to land an easy hit, the bastard pricked me a little, but I was in a far better condition than he was. I then pulled out my mallet because I need this monster into my gang. We then traded blows for a short while, but he blocked most of my attacks, until his battle trance ended. He lost focus and got punched in the mouth with a shield, which reminded me of my very first fight. At the end of it, we only lost one guy, a highwayman, but we captured two highwaymen and five other future highwaymen, if we can find horses to give them. Actually got one of those from their recently defeated gang, alongside a lot of good stuff including my very first ranged weapon, a bag of lowland javelins, best used when you have the high ground. And that's how day 100 ended for our dear bandit queen, Astrid. Long may she live. In the first day, she had literally nothing. Now, she's got weapons, armor, a loyal steed, and a devout cult of 21 raiders with another 18 prospects on the way. And her newly acquired ranged weapons will allow her to make short work of any villagers unlucky enough to run into her crew. On top of all of that, she's also put together enough resources to maintain her warband for years to come. 25,000 denars and a ton of food that would put entire villages to shame. I'd say she's done a pretty good job for a woman. In fact, she's done a far better job than the other ones who've attempted this challenge. Ukzug the Ugly or Balon Blacktide. If you would like to see how those two fared, their stories are linked down below. The first one is a 50-minute video made almost three years ago, and the second is actually an entire series that follows the journey of an ironborn raider from rags to riches. If you haven't already, you should probably watch those until I get an idea for my next video. I hope you've enjoyed Astrid's little story, maybe we'll see her again in another challenge. Until then, I'll be exploring other ideas. There's a few tutorials I would like to make. Those will require a lot of testing and streaming, which I'll be doing on the second channel. Subscribe if you want to catch me live. But that's enough chit chat from me today. Thank you lads for watching and I better see you in my next projects. Goodbye.